Hi, welcome to the next of our series of Practical Electromagnetics for Engineers. We're going to turn a little bit now and not talk about engineering things as much as physics things. In other words, not things that men have created, but things that essentially are within the universe as it was created. And so these things can be a little bit more math and physics-y. And essentially what we're going to be talking about today, as we get into the subject of what electricity is, and what magnetic fields are, something called Coulomb's Law, which is as good a place as any to start with electricity. Um, Coulomb's Law is given by this expression right here. Um, you've probably seen simpler forms of this, if you're familiar with this at all, but those simpler forms are simply uh, simplifications of this expression. This is the right one because this is the complete and accurate expression. And essentially what this says, and we'll get into this more later, is that something called a charge, which is Q, creates an electric field. Um, if you have an electric field, it's essentially a force field, and the force pushes on other charges, and the force is given by this expression right here, and the force is essentially equal to the charge that's feeling the electric field times the strength of the electric field and in the direction of the electric field. Now, now this is a lot to handle, um, so let's get into this in a little bit more detail. It turns out that, that from a historical point of view, uh, Charles Coulomb, who, who Coulomb's Law is named after, was a military engineer who wanted to get into a university in Paris in the 18th century. But it turned out that um, he didn't have any money. So in order to get some money, he entered a competition for making better compasses for the Navy. And he made a compass that could detect very small forces, as small as two and a half nanograms. But his measurements were so bollocked up by um, static electricity that he ended up measuring the force of electricity instead. And this, this is the apparatus he used, which essentially just hung something from a very, very fine thread here to measure the small forces. It's called a torsional balance. And it actually amazes me that somebody could measure um, things as small as two and a half nanograms back in the 17th century. So where are we with this right now? Um, we know that Coulomb's law says we're going to generate a vector at any particular point in space that we measure the electric field at, and I'm calling that this vector r sub m. So we have a point r sub m out here we want to measure the vector at. The direction of this electric field that we're generating is in the direction from RQ to RM. Now this gets a little bit complicated to draw, so I'm going to do something, which is I'm going to set RQ equal to zero. I'm going to put my charge here at the center of the coordinate system. And you might think to yourself, okay, this is BS, because he's just made a simple case where he's able to take this complex expression and simplify it down to that expression right there, which, which admittedly is, is quite a bit simpler. It turns out that this is really a legitimate trick because in the real world we have something called translational symmetry and rotational symmetry. And what that says is if I do an experiment at one point in space and then I move the experiment to a different place and I do the experiment again, I'll get the same results. It doesn't matter where we put the origin of our coordinate axis. Any point is as good as any other point. And this is important to remember because a lot of problems become really easy if you put the coordinate axis origin at the right point. Rotational symmetry is the same thing. It doesn't matter how we rotate the coordinate axes. We'll still get exactly the same result. So I'm allowed to do this. I can simplify this by putting my charge here. So, so, so what do we see? We see essentially that at this point R sub m this expression, Coulomb's law, which is simply the, the putting the charge at the origin of the more complicated expression, creates an electric field, which is a vector. So we have an electric field E that's measured at the point R sub m, which is also represented by a vector from the origin. Let's call that vector R sub m. Right? There's the point. The size of this vector. The length of the vector depends on a couple of things. It depends on the cube of how, f the inverse cube of how far away we are from the origin. Um, that's pretty interesting. It also depends on this something called Q, which is the charge. What is charge? Nobody knows. 
It's a fundamental property of matter. Things have charge or they don't have charge. What Coulomb's law tells us is things that don't have charge, where Q is zero, don't create electric fields. The bigger the charge, the bigger the electric field is. If you double the charge, you get twice the electric field. If you may have ten times the charge, you get ten times the electric field. Coulomb's law also tells us that if we were to put another charge out here, and so let's erase this R sub M, right? And let's call this guy Q sub A, because that's the charge that generates the electric field. And let's say we put another charge Q sub B out here. It's going to feel the electric field and feel a force that pushes this charge away. So charges can repel each other. In other words, charge is a property of matter that creates a force on other charges. If something doesn't have charge, there's no force. The electric field is absolutely invisible to it. It's like it doesn't exist. But if something does have charge, the electric field is like an invisible force field. And that invisible force field is created at every single point in space. And this